Welcome back to Movie Rewind. Today I will tell you about an action, drama, sci-fi movie from 2014 titled Predestination. Spoilers ahead, watch out, and take care. A man walks through a building carrying two large cases at his sides. He takes the staircase to the boiler room, where he removes the drape to reveal an explosive device counting down. Before he can disarm it, he hears someone behind, and narrowly avoids being shot. Running out of time, he places the explosive inside the case he was carrying, but it goes off before he can seal the top. The explosion is largely contained, however, the man is set ablaze, and his face severely burned. He frantically reaches for his second case and another unidentified man pushes it towards him. He then wakes up in a hospital room with his face completely bandaged. Two agents visit him in the hospital, awarding him a medal of valor and congratulating him, as it is his second one. One of the agents reminds him that his next mission is his most important, and asks him to get some rest. As his bandages are removed, the doctor informs him that they had to perform a full facial reconstruction to repair the damage. Skin grafts were performed to repair his face and throat, and the doctor notes how many time jumps the agent has experienced. The man is an agent for an organization called the Temporal Bureau. The Bureau sends agents through time to prevent major crimes that would have resulted in mass casualties. Thus far, the only criminal able to elude them is known as the Fizzle Bomber. His crimes span more than a decade, including the deaths of 11 New Yorkers in March 1975. The mission that he is about to embark on is to be his final, after which he will be decommissioned from the Bureau. The agent then travels to New York 1970, where he gets a job as a bartender. Late one evening, John sits at the bar and they strike up a conversation. John bets the agent a bottle of scotch that he has the best story he's ever heard. The agent says he's on, so John starts from the beginning. September 1945, John, who was born a female, is found on the doorstep of a Cleveland orphanage. The worker who found her names her Jane, and the doctor says he'll be back in a week to check on her. As she got older and started attending school, Jane realized that she was much different from the other students. She was intellectually gifted, especially in math and science, and she was physically strong, frequently getting into fights with boys. Her final year of school, Jane is visited by a recruiter, Mr. Robertson. And he invites Jane to enroll in the Space Corps program, where if selected, she would have the opportunity to travel with the astronauts. Jane agrees to apply, and excels throughout the selection process, posting record scores in both the academic and fitness tests. Her physical, however, reveals that Jane has an intersex condition, she was born with both male and female internal sex organs. Mr. Robertson doesn't tell Jane about the test results. Instead, he blames her disqualification on a fight she got into with another applicant and promises to appeal her case to the board. Jane enrolls in night classes and meets a man after inadvertently running into him. They share a conversation at a cafe, which becomes a romantic relationship in the coming weeks. The relationship continues to bloom, and Jane falls deeply in love. One night, while sitting in the park, he tells Jane that he'll be right back, only to leave and never return. Still heartbroken, Jane receives a visit from Mr. Robertson. He reveals that Space Corps is a front for a larger recruiting agency, and that he works for a covert government agency to recruit the best and the brightest. Jane accepts his offer, but soon after learns that she is pregnant from her previous relationship. Jane eventually gives birth to a healthy baby girl, however, a C-section is required to successfully remove the baby. One of the doctors then informs Jane of her condition. He explains that during the operation they were forced to remove her female reproductive organs, but since the male sex organs were intact, Jane was reconstructed as a man. Knowing now that she will eventually have to change her own name, she names the infant Jane. Two weeks later, an unknown man abducts baby Jane from the hospital nursery. Despite her sorrow, Jane spends the next 11 months undergoing surgical procedures and hormone therapy, eventually becoming John. The agent then asks if he could put the man that ruined John's life in front of him, would he able to kill him? The agent guarantees John that he can put the mystery man in front of him, and that John can do whatever he wants with him, and also get away with it. He takes John to the basement and locks the door behind them. The agent then explains that he works for Mr. Robertson, as an agent for the Temporal Bureau. He pulls out a time warp device and says that he will put John in front of the man he's been looking for, if he agrees to be recruited into the Temporal Bureau afterwards. They travel back to Cleveland, Ohio, 1963. The agent explains that their time disruption footprint needs to be kept to a minimum. The Bureau allows for slight variations, but it's important they keep their interactions to an absolute minimum. After the agent lays out the parameters, 
John asks if he still has a choice, and the agent replies that there's always a choice. John goes to the school campus, where he runs into himself as Jane. He tells his prior self that she is beautiful, as the agent watches from a distance. The agent then uses the time warp and travels back to New York 1970. He locates the fizzle bomber but misses his first shot. The fizzle bomber shoots back before fleeing, and the agent searches the building for him. The fizzle bomber surprises him around a corner, but the agent disarms him, and a fight ensues. The agent catches one of the bomber's punches but gets knocked out by a kick. The fizzle bomber then retrieves his gun and walks off, leaving the agent on the ground. The agent regains consciousness and hears shots being fired. He goes to investigate and sees his former self, injured and struggling to get back to the time device. The agent pushes the time warp to him, and he disappears to 1992. The agent then picks up his own device and travels to 1964. The agent meets with Robertson and gives him a piece of evidence recovered from the fizzle bomber. Robertson says that he made an illegal jump, thereby jeopardizing everyone's safety in the future, including the agent's own. He reiterates that the fragments of matter left behind after each jump, the Bureau can only repair so much. If it becomes too much it can result in psychosis, or the onset of dementia. The agent says that he's fine, that he had to try again to stop the fizzle bomber, but to no avail. Robertson tells him that he is more than an agent, he is a gift given to the world through a predestination paradox. Soon after, Robertson bids the agent farewell, and a nurse walks out of the adjacent room. The agent enters before the door can swing closed, and he walks through the nursery, picking up a baby girl. He returns to his hotel room with the infant, where he listens to a recording that he had left for himself, before using the time warp again. Meanwhile, John and Jane are conversing at a cafe. They share a coffee, and John says that Jane has never been in love, even though it's the only thing she thinks about. Although offended, Jane doesn't deny that it's accurate. The agent arrives in a different hotel room, showing that he's now in 1945. He takes the baby to a doorstep and gives her some parting words. The agent then returns to 1963 to reunite with John. It is now June 24, 1963. Two and a half months after John met Jane. The agent finds them sitting on a park bench and catches John's attention. John turns to Jane and says that he will be right back, before kissing her on the cheek. John points his gun at the agent and says that he tricked him. John asserts that he's not going to leave Jane, but the agent says that some things are predestined, and that you can't change the inevitable. The agent explains that he, John, Jane, and baby Jane, they are all the same person. They jump to the Temporal Bureau, August 1985. Robertson gives the agent an envelope containing new leads, which were recovered from the evidence he gave Robertson. His final mission now completed, the agent plans to return to New York, January 1975, where he will be decommissioned, and his field kit deactivated. He leaves a tape recorder next to John's bed before leaving the bureau. The agent jumps to 1975. He sits back to have a drink, and enters the decommission code on his time warp, but the deactivation fails. The agent opens the envelope that Robertson had given him, and finds a purchase order for the timer used by the fizzle bomber. The agent then goes back through all of the clues he had found and recorded while tracking the fizzle bomber through time. He finds the fizzle bomber at a local laundromat and enters with his gun drawn. The fizzle bomber turns around, and the agent is shocked to see his older self. The fizzle bomber says that Robertson set the whole thing up, and that his actions ultimately saved more lives, than he ever could have while working at the bureau. He rifles through a collection of his prior acts, and points out how each of them was necessary for the greater good. The fizzle bomber goes on to say that if the agent shoots him, he is predestined to become him. He says if the agent wants to break the chain, he has to learn to love him again. But the agent isn't interested in hearing any more. He shoots the fizzle bomber multiple times, and he dies in the laundromat. As the agent sits beside the still functional time warp, it's uncertain if the fizzle bomber was telling the truth. Was he right? that the agent is now predestined to become the fizzle bomber? Or was he suffering from delusions, a side effect of too many time jumps? Okay guys, thank you for watching. Please leave a like on the video, and subscribe to see more.